we will have, a, I'm going to give you a heads up. We will have another one of these. Uh, I, now I'm blanking on what day it is. The, the, the last Wednesday in August, we will have Ed Clements uh, doing a college football preview. And hopefully we're still on for a season come then. But tonight uh, we will have a, a great guest and a great friend of mine, uh, Jody Ferguson. Jody's a native Austinite. Um, he moved back here five years ago. Um, and I knew him before he moved back, but since he moved back, he's become one of my closest friends. Uh, he and his, his brother Scott are like brothers to me, and so I'm real excited to have him on tonight. Uh, Jody has authored uh, dozens of articles, chapters, and books from his time as an academic and an international affairs expert. He's been published in multiple periodicals, including the Wall Street Journal and the International Herald Tribune. He was awarded the Department of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service for his work in the Pentagon, and he also was a Fulbright Fellow in Moscow. During the, the last few decades, he's lived in East Asia, in Europe, and in Russia, and he speaks French, Japanese, and Russian. He has a PhD in International Relations from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, which is, as most of y'all know who are, any, know anything about that area, that is one of the most prestigious schools for international studies and, and an incredible degree for him to have. And, and we're glad Dr. Ferguson's here. He recently left his career uh, with a defense contractor in order to start writing fiction. And his first novel, uh, Above the Water, which is a historical fiction novel uh, and takes place in East Asia, will be published in September. And we'll hear about, about that later. Um, Jody's ex areas of expertise in particular are China and Russia and East Asia generally. And as we all know, there are a few things in our world today, despite the pandemic, uh, going on with China and Russia. And so we look forward to hearing from you, Jody. And I'm going to mute myself and turn the floor over to you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing you. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Tim. I really appreciate it. Can you all hear me OK? OK, good. Um, I'm going to do a share screen in a second and put some slides up. but. Uh, First off, I wanted to thank headliners for having me. Thank everyone that's here tonight that joined us. Thanks to Tim and to Sue Miller for uh, helping, encouraging me and helping me to join the headliners. I'm one of the newer members now, I suppose. And thanks to Kevin for setting this up tonight. Thanks to McKinnon Morton also for always her administrative help. Um, this summer, uh, well, the topic of my talk, I'm, as you saw in the email, is, is the war in East Asia and the Pacific, World War II in East Asia and the Pacific, and potential lessons we may derive uh, for what's going on today. Okay, bear with me while I put this share screen on. Um, I'm going to be throwing a lot of data and information at you all in a very short period of time, so bear with me. This year and particularly this summer we've been hearing a lot of uh, 75th anniversary commemorations uh, about the end of the war uh, World War II and starting in May we heard about um, May the 8th VE Day the 75 75th anniversary of that uh, just recently we heard about 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in two days will be the 75th anniversary of the end of the war in the Asia Pacific. But really, for our purposes, what, we, what I'd like to talk about tonight is when did the war actually break out? When did World War II actually happen? You ask somebody that question in Europe and they'll generally tell you September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. You ask a Russian, he'll tell you June 21st, 1941. You ask most Americans that tell you December 7th, 1941. A lot of historians have made the argument, and I'm going to make try and make the case tonight that World War II, the global conflict actually, began earlier in August of 1937. In fact, you could make the argument that it began 83 years ago today on August the 13th, 1937. Now, um, what happened up until that time that led to the outbreak of the war in Asia, which subsequently led to an outbreak of the larger global war. Japan, as everyone knows, uh, has, was a rising power at the time, and it was, uh, it was uh, engaged in outright territorial grab. They, they had developed their industry. They developed their, 
their military along Western lines. And they had basically in their own minds, they were mimicking the West when they began a power grab across the East Asia region. I'm gonna put a map up next. It's not the best map, but it kind of give us an idea of what was going on. But what, what happened that led to the outbreak of the war in 1937 that I would argue? Well, beginning, as I mentioned, Japan was a rising power in the region. And uh, it, it began uh, amidst the, the colonial scramble that was going on in the late 19th century among European nations and the United States as well. Japan reached out as well and fought a, a, a short war with China in, 18, in the 1890s. And in the war, they, they gained political control of Taiwan, which, as we know, was at the time was known as Formosa. They also gained political suzerainty of the Korean Peninsula. Ten years later, they fought a war against the Russians in which they gained control of the Laodong Peninsula right here, as you can see my cursors going over, uh, and the South Manchurian Railroad, a network of railways that were strategic and very vital to the industry of, of northeastern China. Uh, not long after that, China had its own revolution. Um, the last imperial dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty, was overthrown. And in 1911 and in 1912, January the 1st, actually 1912, Sun Yat-sen declared the founding of the Republic of China. Uh, its successor state, of course, is on Taiwan today. Um, China, although it had overthrown the Qing dynasty, it had basically had, was, had fallen into a series of fiefdoms that were controlled by warlords. Sun Yat-sen maintained control mainly along the eastern seaboard up around Shanghai. He died and he was replaced by Chiang Kai-shek, a general Chiang Kai-shek. The first great national movement, you could argue, that happened among the Chinese in this new republic happened on May the 4th, 1919, when in reaction to the Versailles Treaty, the Chinese rose up in a series of protests, demonstrations, embargoes against Japan because the victors at Versailles had <clears throat> accorded Japan control of German possessions in China, including the town, uh, the, the city of Tsingtao. Um, but the Chinese uh, re, uh, dem demonstrations and, and the antipathy was not just aimed at Japan, it was also aimed at the Western nations, the United States, Great Britain, France, who had gained control of a series of treaty ports. And you're going to be hearing the term international settlements, Western concessions during my talk. And it's in reference to a series of treaty ports that Western nations had slowly taken control of during the 19th century and in the early 20th century. And they were essentially Western territories all up and down the Chinese seaboard and down the Yangtze River Basin. Western cities that were built in Western arc with Western architecture. There you had Western trading houses, Western banks, schools, country clubs. In fact, the Chinese maritime customs collector was a British national for almost 100 years. So the West really controlled China. Japan saw what was going on and wanted a piece of the pie as well. Um, but you're going to be hearing more about, if you can imagine, think about the United States, if the Mississippi River Valley, if you had New Orleans, Memphis, St. Louis, along with New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, controlled essentially by foreign powers, stationing foreign troops with foreign gunboats and controlling trade. That's the situation China was in at the time. And that's why you kind of can understand their reference to the century of humiliation that you hear still thrown about often by Chinese leadership. Um, they felt that they really were uh, dominated and unjustly so by the West and by the Japanese. Well, by 1931, the Japanese took control of the province here of Manchuria. Um, it was not really so much by design. It was an operation carried out, a rogue operation carried out by Japanese army officers, but the Japanese government acquiesced. And what's interesting is that Manchuria was the homeland of the last Chinese dynasty, the Qing dynasty. And Japanese, rather than put one of their own people on the throne and leadership, they, 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 they put on the deposed Chinese emperor, Puyi. Uh, 
and he became the leader of this puppet state that the Japanese had formed. And things kind of settled down. There was not a lot of reaction in the West to the Japanese seizing Manchuria. Remember, we were at the height of the Depression. And all of the references, if you look at the literature and the press of the time, it was referred to as the China incident. There was no reference to a war or anything like that. It was simply known as the China incident. And there was generally a collective shrug in the West. The, the League of Nations did send a commission to try and rectify what was going on, but it was, it was a very weak organization. The United States wasn't even a member. The Soviet Union wasn't a member. Germany wasn't a member. And when the League came out on the side of the Chinese, the Japanese basically said, okay, well, we're just gonna leave the League of Nations. And that's what happened. Things settled down. What happened next though, um, in 19, August, 1937, 83 years ago, uh, on July, I'm sorry, July the 6th, 1937, there was another incident closer to Beijing um, at a bridge outside of Beijing known as the Marco Polo Bridge. It was so called because Marco Polo had made reference uh, in it, in his descriptions of his travels in China in the late 1200s. Um, what happened was that, again, rogue Japanese officers attacked some Chinese soldiers. There was confrontation, skirmishes went on, and the Japanese took the occasion to seize Beijing and Tianjin, its port city. And again, in the West, it was kind of a, there wasn't much of a reaction. At this point, the West was in the throes of the Spanish Civil War, the Depression was still going on, Hitler was rising. So there really wasn't a lot of thought or you know, time given to the idea of what was going on in China. Japanese assumed control of North China, including, as I mentioned, Beijing called Peking at the time. But things kind of quieted down and, and, and from what you read from the history, the Japanese probably would have been content to just let things stay with their de facto control of North China. The Chinese were very weak under Chiang Kai-shek. Indeed, they didn't really have many forces up around Beijing because the area was controlled by a warlord and Chiang didn't feel he had a good political control of this guy. So what Chiang decided to do was he decided to take the fight south. He decided, uh, actually 83 years ago today, August the 13th, 1937. Some people argue this is when World War II, the global war truly began. Um, and what happened was that Chiang decided to confront the Chinese, not up around Beijing or Peking, but down around Shanghai, where he had, for a variety of reasons, he decided to do this. He had political control there. He was felt much more firm in his control of the local leaders. It was also, sat astride the mouth of the Yangtze River, the estuary of the Yangtze River, China's commercial, vital commercial artery. And he also felt that the area around Shanghai was more conducive to war with the Japanese because the area north of the city was very, very marshy. And the northern part of Shanghai, which was controlled by the Japanese as a concession, I had mentioned the concessions earlier, Shanghai, the main part of Shanghai was controlled by the British the French and the Americans, and there were, there were concessions, three concessions there, the Japanese concession, the international settlement, and the French concession. Chang, most importantly, felt that he should stand up against the Chinese, I'm sorry, against the Japanese, I beg your pardon, in Shanghai, because he felt the West would take notice. Well, what was it about the West that he felt needed to, to, to be done? Well, first of all, his wife, uh, Sung Mei Ling, who's pictured here alongside him, she was American educated, went to Wellesley College. They say she even spoke English with a, with, with a bit of a Southern accent because she and her sisters had gone to a boarding school in Macon, Georgia when they were in high school. She urged her husband to try to do what he could to bring the West into the war. They felt Shanghai was the area where they could best do this. So on Friday the 13th, August the 13th, Chang attacked um, used a provocation as an excuse to attack Japanese troops that were stationed there to protect their concessions that were there. And by the way, the Japanese had large numbers of warships that were on the Yangtze and the Wangpu River just outside of Shanghai. So when Chiang made his attack there, he was melt, met with overwhelming force by the Japanese. Um, and what happened next 
really you could argue was the the seed for the conflict that ended up into into the world war as we know it the next day after the fighting started on august the 14th which was known as black saturday the japanese made a, a very concerted offensive in the northern shanghai suburbs they shelled bombed the chinese part of the city not the what they were very careful not to touch the Western concessions, the French concession or the international settlement where the British and the Americans were. They attacked Shanghai, went on the offensive. This photo you see on the left is a picture of a baby who was in the Northern train station of Shanghai, whose parents had been killed in the bombing. And I'll, I'll come to this photo in a minute again. But what happened next was what really perhaps brought the war to the West. Japanese airplanes, I'm sorry, forgive me, Chinese airplanes that were attempting to bomb Japanese forces just on the northern suburb of Shanghai, also attempting to bomb Japanese warships on the Yangtze, bombed by inadvertently dropped their bombs right smack in the middle of the two busiest thoroughfares of the Western concessions. On this picture in the middle, you'll see is something called the, the Sincere Department Store. And it was on Nanking Road, which was the busiest commercial thoroughfare in Shanghai. Moments later, a bomb was dropped outside the British-run uh, Cathay, Cathay Hotel, which was on the Bund, which was the waterfront street in Shanghai. Over 2,000 uh, innocent civilians were killed, not only in this bombing, but in the, bombing, the bombings conducted by the Japanese. If you compare that Four months earlier in Guernica, which was so famous in the West, the bombing of the Basque town in Northern Spain, several hundred people were killed, civilians. In Shanghai on this day, over 2,000 were killed. I don't know the exact numbers, there could have been more. And there were scores of Westerners. And most interestingly, for our purposes, four Americans were killed. You could argue these were the first four Americans killed in World War II. And scores, as I mentioned, scores of Westerners were killed. The fight went on for the next three months in the outskirts of, 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 Yank, of, the, of Shanghai. As you can see here, the, right, the picture on the right, you have Chang's best troops that were fighting there. And as you can note from their helmets, their German helmets, the Stahlhelm, which would become so famous around the world a year later, uh, these were troops that were trained by German officers. And, and the best Chinese officers, the best Chinese troops were thrown into the fray by Chang. He really wanted to try and meet the Japanese with his best people. And within a, within a month, there were over a million troops engaged in fighting on the Yangtze and outside of Shanghai. And if you go back, I'm going to go back a couple of slides. And I mentioned the international settlements. If you look at this photo, this is a photo of here of Westerners mainly, looking at the fighting going on in Northern Shanghai from the roofs of their hotels, their apartment buildings. It's, it's, it's really an astounding photo. They were somehow, apart from those bombings that I mentioned earlier, kept in a cocoon and they sat on their rooftops. It's, it's as if New Yorkers were standing on the tops of their apartment buildings and banks and whatnot and, and watching across the Hudson River because there is a body of water in between here, Sucho Creek, watching two armies fighting in New Jersey. Um, so what happened next was that Chang's forces, as I mentioned, his best forces, put up a valiant effort. But in the end, the Japanese were too powerful. And what happened was that Chang withdrew his troops to Nanking and then withdrew them further to Chongqing. The Japanese were left with an end Took, went down the Yangtze River to Nanking, were left with an indefensible city and attacked it, captured it, and instituted an orgy of rape, murder, looting. Uh, it was one of the most infamous, infamous incidents of the Second World War, known as the Rape of Nanking. Um, this, though, you could argue, and I'll try to make the point tonight, that this is when it became a global conflict. The United States and Great Britain took notice. Um, as I mentioned, there were deaths, British and American deaths, and it was no longer referred to in Western press as the China incident. 
you now referred, heard it being referred to as the Sino-Japanese War. The United States began aiding the Chinese in earnest. And at the same time, beginning in 1938, there was the United States instituted a succession of increasingly restrictive trade measures against the Japanese. The export, import export control act was tightened. The Japanese US commercial treaty was abrogated. In 1940, after the Japanese attacked Northern Indochina, which we know today, of course, is Vietnam, the United States instituted a steel and scrap metal embargo against the Japanese who were very dependent on US steel. The same year, 1940, the United States moved its Pacific fleet to Pearl Harbor. It closed the Panama Canal to Japanese shipping. And the following year, when the Japan attacked further into, North, into Indochina, the United States instituted an oil embargo. And the oil embargo was really the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. But beginning in the late 1930s, with this battle in Shanghai, you had a, a, a groundswell of great support for China in the United States. You can see this poster from the Time on the right. Uh, the owner of the Time Life Corporation and Life Magazine, which is the most influential magazine in America at the time, was a man by the name of Henry Luce. He was your Rupert Murdoch of the day, if you would, if you were, or the the um, the. Uh, uh, earned the uh, the guy who ran the Hearst, Randolph Hearst, that's it, the Hearst Corporation. Anyway, Luce was interestingly born a, of, chi of, uh, ch of missionary parents in China. He was very pro-Chinese. The picture that I showed you earlier of the Chinese baby in the, in the bombed out rain, rail station, that picture was seen by over 130 million Americans in Life Magazine. Luce put forward his best effort to get the Americans worked up about the war in China, not only in Life Magazine, but in Time Magazine, Fortune, Newsweek, all of the magazines that he owned. FDR was a big proponent also of support for China. His, interestingly, his grand, his maternal grandfather, Warren Delano, made his fortune on the China trade back in the 19th century. FDR was very pro-Chinese. Pearl Buck had published a series of best-selling novels, including The Good Earth about China at the time. So there was a, a huge groundswell of support in the United States and, and China. And once the United States instituted an oil embargo in Japan in the summer of 41, that led to um, the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. So you could make the argument that World War II really began 83 years ago today in Shanghai. This is a picture of the Bund um, from that time. And you can see the Art Deco buildings, the Cathay Hotel that I mentioned where a bomb exploded is right here, the peak roof. Um, and you could make the argument and that, you know, the war started here. So what kind of lessons or, or, or can we draw from what happened back then to what's going on today in East Asia? Well, I think there are striking parallels to what happened then and to what's going on today. As in the 1930s, China is a rising power that's become quite bellicose, quite belligerent. Um, in the 1930s, the West was quite tepid about what was going on in China with the Japanese. There really was not too much made of what was going on. You, you can see that in the 2000s, the last, well, you know, in the last decade or so, as China's become increasingly belligerent, you haven't seen so much reaction in the West. Because as we all know, commercially, China is such an important partner. But just in the last few months, Chinese have really increased the dial on pressure on its neighbors and in the region. As I mentioned, in the last few months, China has further tightened judicial control over Hong Kong in contravention to its agreement with the UK to allow judiciary independence in Hong Kong until 2047. It has intruded into Taiwan's airspace on numerous occasions. It has trained guns on the Philippine Navy. It has sunk a Vietnamese fishing boat. It has harassed Malaysian vessels. It has rammed a Japanese Coast Guard vessel in the East China Sea. It has reignited a deadly border conflict with China in the Himalayas. It 
It has conducted cyber attacks and economic coercion against Australia and has incarcerated without due process two Canadian nationals in retaliation for the arrest of a Huawei executive in Vancouver. So Chinese are really increasing pressure and um, I, I feel there are great parallels with what's going on, not only with Japan in the 30s, but a lot of historians are talking about Germany prior to World War I. Richard Rosecrans authored, authored a book, I think about five years ago, called The Next Great War. He was a historian for many years at UCLA, and before that, I believe, uh, Penn. Um, but anyway, Rosecrans compares the outbreak of World War I to the current state of U.S.-Chinese relations, and he writes of the tyranny of small things. In other words, small events that seemingly in and of themselves seem like small events, nothing really to worry about. But as they increase in number, it leads to the chance of the outbreak of conflict. Uh, another recent article was written by Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. Title of the article, which was in Foreign Affairs, was Beware the Guns of August in Asia. And he's arguing the same thing, that, that we could be sleepwalking into a war with China, uh, and just like happened in, in, in Europe before World War I with the Germans. But others have said that it's more like the Chinese in the 1930s. And a very well-regarded uh, Japanese retired diplomat, a man that I know well from my time living in Japan, and writes some really, really good stuff. He, there was an article recently about Chinese actions in the New York Times, and they quote him. And his quote was, their nationalistic ambition will not end. I'm very concerned, and nobody can stop it as they couldn't stop us in Manchuria in the 1930s. So I'm going to leave it. I know I threw a lot of data out to, to all of you all over the last short amount of time, but I'm going to leave it for questions. Now, first off, though, or lastly, I want to thank all of you for coming out and to let me talk about a subject which is very near and dear to my heart. If you're interested in my novel, my novel takes place in Shanghai. The protagonist, it's a love story, but the protagonist is an American correspondent who witnesses and documents a lot of the events that I, that I mentioned today in my talk that happened in Shanghai. It's called Above the Water. You can learn more about it with excerpts and a description of the novel on my website, jodyferguson.com. Please visit it. I've also got blogs on there about my travels, uh, about my time living in the Far East and in Russia. I have blogs about my family and about Texas history. Um, and I also have reviews of books that I've read recently. And if you wanna dig deeper into the topic that we spoke about today, through my website, you can find a YouTube channel uh, that will give a short, that I give short talks about various topics that I talked about today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow you all to um, ask any more questions that you may have. And uh, I'll stop. I'll let Tim take over from here. Thanks, Jody. That was great. Um, as you know, I have a, a deep interest in this topic myself personally and, and appreciate it. And it, it is fascinating to uh, think about the parallels and the risk of history repeating itself. I guess a particular interest right now um, to me is Hong Kong. And you mentioned the agreement that China signed with Hong Kong, I guess, in connection with the turnover in 1999? 97. Uh, 97. Um, comment on what those terms the, the, the key terms that they violate, I gather it's taken away some of the civil rights and things like that. But then also, what is the prospect for Hong Kong um, as such a key financial and, and commerce center of all of East Asia um, if the Chinese take over, full takeover? Essentially, the Chinese promised one country, two systems when they made the agreement with the UK in 1997. In that promise was an agreement to allow, as I mentioned, basically Chinese, uh, Hong Kong's sovereignty to remain intact, judicial independence, uh, political freedoms to remain intact for 50 years, at least 50 years. At the time the Chinese agreed to this, they were hoping they could get the Taiwanese also to agree to let Taiwan come into the same sort of umbrella system. By now, they've realized that's not going to happen. The Taiwanese are, are never going to agree to this. As for what's going to happen with Hong Kong, essentially, um, 
their any political freedom that they had is pretty much gone. If you're accused of a crime and you're a, chi a Hong Kong resident, what in the crime among those crimes you could be accused of, would, by the way, would be speaking disparagingly about the People's Republic of China. If you're accused of, of, a, of a crime of politically disparaging China or whatever else it may be, no matter where you are, whether you're in Taiwan, Hong Kong, overseas, you are, you are, you, you are, you are, can be brought to China and brought to justice in China, mainland China. They can extradite you to the mainland and put them in their own courts. And as for China, Hong Kong is a financial center. I'm not so sure that this doesn't play in exactly what China wants. China would love to have Shanghai replace Hong Kong as financial center of East Asia, as it once was during the time that I talked about prior to World War II. Exactly. Uh, the Heller, Andrew Heller has a question. How divergent do you see the views of the general population positions? How divergent are those from the government policies and positions? I think that in Hong Kong, they're quite divergent. You have some people, obviously, that are very pro-PRC, pro-mainland China. But I think the population in Hong Kong, they, they, they were used to living the way they lived under the British for, for, for 150 years and how they've lived basically for the last 20 years, which was fairly free to express their, uh, their, their views openly uh, in contravention of whatever the Chinese government might say. When you get to mainland China, it's different. I think the Chinese government, Communist Chinese Party has been very effective at drumming up nationalism and getting their people to believe um, in their vision of the future of China, the future of East Asia. Um, the Chinese really feel that their proper place as the, is, as the dominant power in East Asia and perhaps even further away in the world. And um, they've been very, very, effective in, in getting their people to believe this. And one of those messages that they've given to the people to, to make them believe in this vision is the one I mentioned earlier about the century of humiliation. Look what the West did to us for a hundred years. They had extraterritoriality. Amer uh, Americans, British, French, everyone living in China in these foreign concessions that I mentioned, they were, they had extraterritoriality. They were free from Chinese laws. Even if they committed a, tr a crime outside of a Chinese city, which was a Western concession, they couldn't be tried in Chinese courts. They could only be tried in Western courts. So the Chinese love to point to that and they've been very effective in bringing that up. Uh, thank you, a couple more questions for you. Uh, Elena asked, do you think the Spratly Islands are a potential flashpoint for US-China relations and problems? Yes, potentially they are. And they almost were in 2001, as you all probably remember, there was a Hainan Island incident in which a Chinese fighter jet closely shadowing an American surveillance craft clipped its wing. The Chinese aircraft crashed and the pilot died. The American aircraft had to force a landing on an airstrip on Hainan Island before they were able to get rid of and destroy a lot of the equipment that was highly classified because it was an intelligence gathering airplane. Um, same types of incidents could happen again around the Spratly Islands, could be a flashpoint. You could also argue the same thing could happen around the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, also uninhabited barren islands that are contested by the Japanese and the Chinese. We have told the Japanese government, though we haven't really enunciated this policy publicly, but our government, the Department of Defense, has told the Japanese that yes, these islands fall under our treaty with Japan, because as you all know, we have bilateral defense treaties with six nations in the region. If any of those nations are attacked, we are bound by treaty to come to their defense. Those six, by the way, are Japan, South Korea, Australia, Thailand, the Philippines, and the Mariana Islands. We also have unwritten, unwritten agreements, tacit agreements with Singapore and Taiwan to come to their defense in the event of an attack. Um, may want to come back to that, but uh, to ask a question that's been posed, what are your thoughts about China, the, the, the official government reaction to this issue and the, the SARS uh, virus the, and COVID pandemic? Well, obviously, they're, they're not going to take blame for that. Um, um, they take, you know, umbrage every time uh, the, the president or um, – 
others refer to as the China or the Wuhan virus. Um, there are even conspiracy theories going over the Chinese internet about that it was, it was delivered to China by the US military uh, in an attempt to get the Chinese, uh, have them all infected by this. But um, um, yeah, the Chinese, they, <laughs> That they're not going to agree that you know they they that they're at fault in any way with 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 COVID and as they were not when SARS happened as well. Right. So on this, you mentioned the joint defense uh, treaties, the bilateral joint defense treaties we have, and in particular South Korea. Um, China, they don't have a lot of allies over there, do they? Besides North Korea. You're right. You, they don't have any. They have no allies. Um, in fact, you know, if, if you talk about the, the potential for East Asia becoming the fulcrum again for a global conflagration, um, you could argue that there are parallels, as I talked about today, between World War I and World War II and what's going on today. But if you think about the Cold War, we were able to, um, to avoid a major war with the Soviet Union. Obviously, there were proxy wars. But we were able to avoid a major war with the Soviet Union for, you know, 50, 70 years uh, after the end of the Second World War. Well, a big reason for that was that we had rock solid allies, not just in Europe, but in East Asia as well. And it was a very black and white issue. These allies did not want to fall under the Soviet yoke and in Asia, Nobody wanted to be controlled by communism either, whether it was the Soviet version or the Chinese version. Now, switching over to today, our allies are all in a very precarious state, I would argue, not just in Europe, but in East Asia as well, and, and especially in East Asia. If you look at it, the chances of a war breaking out in East Asia, Although anything's possible, just as anything was possible during the Cold War, it was possible there was a war going to break out with Soviet Union, but it was not probable. You could argue that the war with China would be a little more probable because the allies in the region are all also very dependent. Our allies in the region are very dependent on China for trade. A lot of them have large Chinese diaspora as well. Maybe some of them are sympathetic to China. Our relations with the Philippines are not good right now. Our relations with Thailand are not good. Thailand probably leans closer towards China than it does toward us right now. And you could even argue that the Japanese, they're a little bit concerned about the state of our, of our alliance. And if you were to ask the Japanese to defend, to let the United States use our bases in Japan to defend Taiwan, I, I, I suggest that the Japanese cabinet would be in for a lot of hand wringing and they would be scratching their heads trying to make a very difficult decision whether they want to get into a shooting war over Taiwan with the Chinese because our bases there would be targeted by the Chinese. The only ally we can depend on in the region to the bitter end, and you could argue it's probably, the, and in fact, it's the only ally that has been with, with us in every war since the beginning of the 20th century, and that is Australia. Indeed, and they play rugby there, right? They do. <laughs> well, it's uh, we, and then so let's talk about Australia. Um, obviously, geographically a large country, they are a, a, an incredible ally. Um, assuming we get past the current political issues, uh, diplomatic issues that we that we're in, enduring, and, and we get to a more stable situation with more a little better, better better multilateralism and everything, Australia does have a large dependency on China. I think, did China block the importation of Australian beef or a, a key product? I can't recall. Wasn't that recent? Yes, beef. And I mentioned that they had engaged in economic coercion with the Australians because the Australians were blaming them for COVID. Right. So, yeah. so what happens with that, that lower quadrant? You've got some key, incredibly key strategic resources, which if I recall my history right, one of the triggers for Japan moving south to create their empire was to get to the oil fields of Indonesia and those areas. You've got that same crescent running Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Australia, China looking down on that. Is, is, that, is that a potential risk as much as something along Japan, the Korean Peninsula, or, or these, these weird little islands? 
it's it's less likely that the Chinese would make an over grab for resources like the Japanese did in the Second World War. But it is a striking parallel because China is very resource dependent. They get a lot of their coal from the Australians. I think most of their coal comes from the Australians. Uh, their oil, most of their oil comes through the, the, the Straits, the Malacca Straits of Malacca, between Singapore and Sumatra. Um, but the, Japan, the Chinese probably don't need to make a covert grab. They can, again, use economic coercion. Uh, they've been setting up commercial treaties with a lot of South Pacific Island states. Um, uh, one of their, their modus operandi is to build infrastructure, this, this, this Belt Road initiative that uh, you see in the press. They build, they, build, they build vital infrastructure in developing nations, nations that are energy rich, perhaps. And these nations become more and more dependent on China. And when the, the loans get called, countries find themselves unable to pay them, they're in debt to the Chinese. So there are other ways of getting at it besides uh, outright uh, military grab. Yeah, those uh, those treaties in Belt and Road. I, I guess is Belt and Road still as as uh, vibrant as it was pre-COVID, or are they? I, I'm guessing there's got to be some countries who are preferring not to have large numbers of Chinese workers come visit to build infrastructure at the moment. Yeah, it's in a pretty poor state, and this actually preceded COVID. The reason being was well, economics and politics. Some of the nations. Uh, unable to repay a lot of the loans. Um, there are problems in Pakistan, for example. Pakistanis can't, and they're building vital strategic ports for the Pakistanis as well. And the Chinese Navy is gonna to wanna to be able to use those. Um, they're they're uh, having problems with the Kazakhs as well for ethnic reasons, because the Uyghur minority, the Muslim minority in Western China um, is essentially very similar ethnically to the Kazakhs in the Kyrgyz in Central Asia. And a lot of these nations are criticizing the Chinese and they're also recipients of a lot of the BRI projects. So the projects are under some stress right now and part of that's COVID related, but a lot of that was preceding COVID. Uh, you mentioned Pakistan. So looking south, uh, the issue with India and the Himalayas, how do those issues interplay with China's internal problems, the economic problems we're having with COVID, and you, then you look at the ethnic issues going on um, in India with the, I think, recent Supreme Court ruling that is allowing them to build a Hindu temple where they tore down a mosque in the 90s. There's, there's some serious ethnic issues in India going on. Could those, the internal tensions in both India and China Create, create an even bigger flashpoint potentially there in, in the Himalayas that we need to be worrying about. That's an excellent point, Tim. I totally agree with you. Yes, you know, uh, when <laughs> you've, you've got uh, economic problems at home, there's no better way to get people to overlook them than trump up, you know, nationalist rhetoric. I mean, the playbook goes back millennia in that respect. Uh, look at Adolf Hitler. Um, so, Yes, I definitely could see that. And you're going to see increasing economic stress in China, uh, along with demographic stress as well. And again, uh, again, another parallel in Japan. Japan was having a lot of problems. A lot of their economic problems predated the Depression. They were already having big economic problems in the 20s because World War I had been such a big boon for them economically. And when that dried up, all of those orders for, for rice, for for ships, for steel, things like that, Japanese found themselves in very straightened economic circumstances. And that's when they made their grab, their naked grab for possessions in China, which led in it eventually led to World War II. Scary times we're in, and not just with us. Uh, anybody have any questions out there? I'm not seeing any raised hands, but I may be maybe missing a few. I'm, I'm looking mainly at the chat. Oh, there's uh, William. Uh, how, how much should we worry about Cuba? Uh, the Chinese basically have a lean on Cuba. They've got the roads, the buses, the fuel. It's, you know, how much should we worry about that? Uh, certainly anywhere uh, the Chinese have economic investments. Yeah, they, they're going to have, they're going to have leverage. And Cuba, 90 miles from Florida, certainly is of great interest to us. I would argue, though, 
we should be more worried about Chinese investments, for example, in Panama, where you have the Panama Canal, uh, Mexico, uh, and other vital places in South America. Cuba, yeah, it's important. Um, and uh, it's something that bears keeping an eye on. Um, but there, I think, I think that uh, I, I, I'm more concerned, frankly, right now about Panama. That's, that's, that's an area that gives me the chills. Uh, that is scary. Uh, I mentioned in your introduction, Jody, that, that you know your two uh, your two key areas of expertise, your desk, were Russian and East Asia and China. Um, Japan, was, more I than mean, China, even <laughs> yeah, Japan, East Asia. But the uh, looking north then from China, we got Russia, and there's always right. this, the, the worry of the bear and the dragon. Uh, same issues going on. We've got. Oil, oil prices depressed with, uh, you know, Putin's not getting the oil income he needs. He's got nationalism issues that he's been drum beating those drums forever. Any risk of a, of a, either a war there or even potentially more dangerous for the U.S. Uh, a coming together, uh, two enemies coming together for, to fight the common enemy of, of, of the U.S.? Yeah, this is an issue I've actually looked at for decades. And I remember in the early aughts, just after 2000, when the Chinese and the Russians had, had, they had cemented the last of their border agreements, uh, which had basically, uh, you know, had caused great, great foment in their relations and including conflict in the 60s. But they had, they had finalized the last of the border agreements and the, and people were saying, oh my goodness, you know, the Chinese and the Russians are going to come around and, uh, I mean, kind of the amateur, you know, armchair uh, analyst would say they're going to come together and have an alliance against us. The people that had studied the issue more said, no, you know, they have their, their, um, they have their issues that go back centuries, and there's still even territory in the Russian Far East that some Chinese would like to have back. Uh, I, I was in the camp at the time that that well, actually, no. I mean, they they will they will come together in a marriage of convenience as long as the United States remains the premier world power. Um, we may be in slight strategic retreat, but we are the nation that is still the, by far the strongest militarily, economically on the earth that has global reach. We can prosecute an economic or a shooting war in any corner of the globe within a week, if not sooner, bring force to bear. There are not any other nations that can do that as long as we hold that position, Chinese and the Russians are, are I, I, I will argue, they're not going to let any differences they have drive them apart. They will still have their differences of opinions about certain things, but they're never going to push each other away to the extent that the United States would be able to bring one in, i.e., in, in this case, the Russians against the Chinese. Um, now, as far as a shooting, if there was a shooting war that went on between the United States and one of the two, I don't think the other would become involved. Well, why would they? Wouldn't be to their interest. Just let yeah. them fight it out. And, yeah, sit on the sideline. So. The, the but make don't don't fun. don't underestimate our power to bring them together, um, because they look at us and they see us as the largest threat to. I mean, if you think about it, the Westphalian system that was set up. In, after the Thirty Years' War, the great religious wars in Europe and Westphalian system that basically guided European diplomacy and Western diplomacy through the 20th century. It's non-intervention in each other's domestic affairs. You recognize that you have nation states. They have their own governments, their own systems of government, their own religions, etc. Non-interference in what's going on domestic. You can fight wars over territory, but Essentially, you don't you agree not to 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 intervene. If you think about it, really, I mean, the United States is 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 the one nation in the world that doesn't abide by that philosophy. We see a country that's doing something we don't like internally, and we feel like it's in our strategic interest. We'll go in and and we'll we'll we'll, we'll enact regime change. Chinese and the Russians won't do that. Thanks. Uh, this is probably our last question. It's uh it's it's right on our usual wrap up time, and it. It's from Andrew Heller, and I will uh, ask it and, and tack on, a, I think, a correct stat. His question is, how concerned are you about a, a culture with 5,000 years of strong belief in education, 
uh, and capitalism competing against us in a technology driven economy. And I would add to that question, I believe the statistic I heard a year ago was is that China is producing a million bachelor degree engineers a year and the U.S. is producing 25,000. Yeah, 58,000 or something. I think you and I traded that text at one point. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we do have, as as Andrew points out, this incredible Chinese culture, the, the, you know, the mandarins who have been there for, they've survived dynasties and, and, and regime change themselves. And you've got this incredible culture with the Confucian beliefs they have and, and the belief in education. How are we going to compete with them in the technology driven economy? Yeah, that's a great point that, uh, that was it Andrew, I guess, uh, made and, and Tim, great question. Yeah, this is not the Soviet Union. Chinese have been capitalists for millennia. Um, uh, but not just any ordinary free market capitalists, they've been mercantile capitalists. You remember the threat from Japan in the 80s and before that, you know, mercantile capitalism, mercantile capitalism, they, they're going to they're gonna direct their investments in strategic industries and they're going to outcompete us and they're going to drive us into the, drive us into the ground. Um, yeah, they, they are, in my mind, and I, I had a long discussion one night over many uh, flasks of sake with some Japanese defense ministry colleagues. And I was telling them, you know, th- this is not, you know, the Soviet Union. This is not uh, a run of the mill competitor. This is, this is a, a gigantic tectonic shift in the order of a collapse of the Roman empire. I mean, this is, this is a historical occasion that China is re-emerging on the world stage and they are soon going to surpass the United States as the as the largest economy in the world and some data you know data systems you know you see or data points they already have surpassed us yes they're disciplined uh, but um, you know I'm still a firm believer in liberal democracy market driven economies uh, the Japanese failed in their strategic approach to driving a mercantile economy. Um, I believe the United States can respond well. And I, I think as Church, Winston Churchill said one time in, a, in a, the quote that you'll hear a lot of people, their, their favorite Churchill quote about the United States, that the United States, after exhausting every single losing strategy will eventually adopt the right strategy and come out on top. Um, but yeah, China is not the Soviet Union. It's going to be a long, long strategic competition with them. And it already has begun. It begun, I would argue, began 20 years ago. So. Well, thank you. Uh, that, that's great, Jody. We really appreciate it. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, your book in September, Above the Water. JodyFerguson.com. Yeah, we'll look and, forward and to listen, um, I just really want to make one la- uh, last uh, yeah, give a, 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 a word of thanks to uh, a, a friend of mine, a woman originally from Lexington, Texas, Lynn Perry. She uh, built my website. She's an excellent um, marketer. If you own a small or medium company and you need and you want to build a cool website, if you want to market your firm, She's, she's been fantastic uh, helping me with my book. So I give her a word of thanks tonight. She's actually, I think, has joined us on the chat. Yeah, she's on the call. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Thank so, you, Jody. Uh, yeah. Very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone knows Snow Bar- Snow's Barbecue in Lexington, right? You betcha. Best barbecue in Texas. Um, you get it. We've unmuted everybody as is our tradition. So we can, uh, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, we'll join in a round of applause for uh, Dr. Joseph Ferguson. Joseph, thank you. Really good, Betty. Thank you. Thank you. you. My pleasure. Mr. Ferguson, do you want to give us some more information about the book? Yeah, so jodyferguson.com. The book is called Above the Water. uh, And it is going to be available on September 19th which is also the, the, the 75th occasion, anniversary of the occasion of the opening scene of my book, which is the American liberation of Shanghai. When my protagonist goes back to Shanghai after having uh, 
been fighting during the war years, he goes back to find the love of his life. So, so the book begins with a, with him going there and, uh, Jody Ferguson.com. Um, and, uh, September 19th. Thanks, Jody. Looking forward to it. I expect all of you to buy at least five copies. <laughs> <laughs> and spread the word. If you're in a reading group, book club, you know, um, please. Yeah, we'll do it. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. Good, good presentation. Thanks. Uh, Patty, you all doing all right? I was saying, are you doing all right, Patty? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, it, it need, his book needs to be a headliners book club in the fall. There we go. There you that'll go. Be, yeah, because yeah, be cool. the. Jolly. Thanks. There you go. Buddy. I thought it was like Jolly. Didn't it? Helen. Bruce, Betty. Yes. I like Jolly. It is him. Mm -hmm. oh. Jody? Yes. I just, want to, I just want to say thank you for a great presentation. I enjoyed it very much. And Tim, thank you for putting on a uh, wonderful event. And I hope we do more of these. I think they're great. Thank I you. hope I didn't flood too much data in a short period of time. No, 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 no. no, no. Jody, as, as someone who started going over to China as a guest of the government in the 70s, when we first opened up scientists uh, communicating, um, the change in 50 years has been unbelievable. If, yes. if you went there when no woman wore a skirt, right. everyone was wearing exactly the same shirts and, and slacks. The mouse suits and all on bicycles. Right, and, and I, when I used to go out as a guest of the government, I go to lecture on technology in the cities that had places like Antenna Factory 13 in Shanghai or in Beijing at Northeast Institute or, or some of the other places, the level of sophistication as they came out from under the Gang of Four was so backward. They didn't have any the, the technology institutes were, were 30 years behind us. Yes. What about the computers? Yeah, the computers were ancient. Yeah. And if you go back today, it's unbelievable. I agree. I, would vis I was able to visit in the late 80s, early 90s. Go on my website and look at my Shanghai blog about when I, I visited in 92. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to go back and see it again. But I, I get back there occasionally. And uh, it's amazing the changes that have happened in China. And it, you go there, it's mind boggling. And, and you wonder about them as a strategic competitor. Like I said, it is not the Eastern Bloc. Thank you for a very good presentation tonight. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining me. I loved your slides. Thank Great. you. Uh, yeah. We'll see everybody in two weeks uh, for uh, Ed Clements. We'll talk about some football. Great. Have a good evening. Night. <laughs> good night, everyone. Welcome. Good night. 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 Good night.